we'll get started. Um, thank you for coming. Um, hello to everyone who's following on Zoom. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Kim McAllister to you guys. Um, I've known Kim, uh, I guess, initially through working in study section at NIH together, but uh, I've followed her work uh, as someone who's interested in uh, development and dendritic spines. Um, I was always a big fan of her research. Um, Kim uh, got her PhD in neurobiology um, at Duke University, working with Larry Katz, where she did really amazing work on uh, showing how neurotrophins regulate dendritic growth. And um, then she went on uh, to do a postdoc with Chuck Stevens at the Salk Institute. Um, and I was sort of intrigued to see that she was using FM143. You guys remember FM143 to stay in synapses? Uh, those were the days. Okay, I'm old. <laughs> um, so um, after that, uh, she um, uh, started her own lab at uh, UC Davis in 2000. Um, and she's been a full professor there for more than a dec decade. Um, Quick anecdote, actually, she was on Paymont's thesis committee, and she told me this morning it was really touch and go for a while there. Um, I did not say that. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, she was super impressed. <laughs> well, here he is now. Um, so sorry, I couldn't resist, Paymont. Um, so actually, after starting her lab, um, there was so much excitement for her research that she won every award that you can imagine. Sloan, Pew, NARSAD, uh, March of Dimes, uh, uh, Merck, I'm, I'm missing a few, but uh, eventually even the Society for Neuroscience Young Investigator Award. Um, so amazing accomplishment. Um, her research, I, I suppose this could have been the title of your re research talk, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right? Um, you've always been interested in studying how immune molecules regulate synapse formation um, and plasticity, both in health and disease. Um, and, and, and you were doing that before it was cool, right? I mean, nowadays, you know, the trainees probably think, oh yeah, so she works on immune system and neuroscience and micro, everybody does that now. But back then it was really, um, she was one of the few. Um, so in, in many ways, she, she was one of the pioneers. Um, eventually this work led her to use the maternal immune activation uh, model of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, that, that many other people use, um, including my lab. And, uh, and, and some of her papers so far are sort of setting the standard for how to do these experiments. Um, through this work, she's been able to collaborate with people who work with non-human primates um, and starting these models in, in monkeys. And, and that also led to a collaboration with Dan Gashwin here at UCLA um, that um, is very exciting. Um, Besides being an amazing scientist, uh, I was impressed reading her CV about how much um, effort she dedicates to service both at UC Davis and nationally. Um, at UC Davis, uh, you know, her, her really prominent job is that she is the director of the Center for Neuroscience, where she oversees the entire strategic plan for neuroscience at UC Davis, uh, which means, um, you know, setting up seed grants, renovating buildings, uh, starting relationships with industry, you name it. Uh, it's really, really impressive. And um, on top of that, she um, is on the advisory board for Autism Speaks um, and for Pew Scholars. And um, I'm not even talking about like her amazing uh, teaching credentials, her, her teaching reviews, which I'm glad she listed in her CV are just spectacular. She is literally the whole package. It's, it's truly an honor to, to have her here. Uh, someone who can really... Um, do phenomenal research, but also be an advocate for the next generation of scientists. Um, today, the title of her talk is Novel Roles for Immune Molecules and Regulating Synapse Formation in Health and Disease. Welcome. Carlos, you outdid yourself and you certainly outdid me. I've never, I've never heard myself talked about in that kind of light. So thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it is so great to be back giving a talk in person. This is this is terrific. I love the invitation. It's wonderful hearing about science all day. I'm looking forward to talking to more people about science this afternoon. So, um, so thank you for coming in person too. And and hello to everybody on Zoom. I hope um, I hope you can hear me okay. Okay. So, um, as uh, Carlos mentioned, I've been interested in studying immune molecules uh, for a long time, but. 
and we worked this out. Man, the um, slides are not forwarding again. Can I escape and, and do what we did before? Okay. Oh, there we go. Ha, Carlos got it. Yeah, it's weird though. So yeah, I can do it that way. I can just click it on the screen, it's fine. Um, okay, so, so uh, as Carlos mentioned, I've been interested in brain development for um, my entire career for, for over, um, over 25 years. And my lab has been focusing on a central question of how do connections form between neurons in the developing brain and how are they modified by activity and also in disease. And because we're interested in the developing brain, uh, we've been focusing on two specific diseases of the developing brain, autism and schizophrenia. So I don't think that I need to go through uh, the statistics of describing um, what autism and schizophrenia are to this audience. Um, but in order to be able to, to study how connections change in these disorders, we need to understand what causes them, right? And there, there are experts here at UCLA that are leading the way in identifying the genetic causes of, of both autism and schizophrenia. And we know that these are heritable disorders. There are many genes. It's complicated um, as to what, uh, how many different genes uh, cause these diseases. But in generally, it's been thought that changes in genetic mutations lead to aberrant neural development that lead to changes in, in behaviors that then lead to the diagnosis of autism or schizophrenia. But as many of you know, it's a little more complicated than even the complicated genetic perspective because there are also environmental risk factors that interact with genetic risk to lead to autism and schizophrenia. And interestingly, even the uh, genetic mutations can change the responsiveness to those environmental risk factors. Some of these mutations can lead to aberrant immune responses, either um, too robust or too weak immune responses, or ineffective toxin clearance that then lead to a synergistic interaction with uh, continued exposures to environmental factors like infection and toxins. And as, as many of you may know, it's not just about changes in brain development, but there also are ongoing changes in immune development that lead to ongoing neurobehavioral dysfunction and ongoing immune dysfunction in a subset of individuals with autism and schizophrenia throughout their lifespan. So, so there is a lot of evidence now that immune dysregulation is linked to both autism and schizophrenia. Uh, there have been reports of genetic links with immune genes, including uh, cytokine, chemokine, cytokine signaling molecules, MHC class one molecules. Their patients and their relatives have an increased incidence of autoimmune disorders for both diseases. There's evidence of increased plasma or brain cytokines, altered expression of immune genes and neural inflammation in the brains of, of patients. Maternal viral infection has been associated with an increased incidence of, of both disorders and pharmacological treatments um, that are used for schizophrenia and sometimes also for autism, don't just alter synaptic function and neurotransmitters, but they also alter immune responsiveness. So, so in the lab, we've been looking at a lot of these different links. Uh, we, um, and we've been guided by a central uh, working hypothesis, which is that immune molecules in the brain might mediate the effects of either or both genetic mutations or environmental risk factors um, in altering brain connections during, during these diseases. So we have a, a number of um, published papers looking at the role of MHC class one molecules in typical brain development. MHC negatively regulates synapse formation. I'm not gonna have time to tell you about those. Um, we also have been looking at uh, the role of a number of different cytokines that have been upregulated in the brains of individuals with autism and schizophrenia in um, altering connectivity in developing brains. I also am not gonna be able to tell you about that today. And instead, I'm gonna focus on the topic that Carlos mentioned, which is on maternal viral infection and how it might be associated with an increased incidence of autism and schizophrenia in offspring. Okay. So, so there have been, uh, 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 there's been a, a number of papers that have uh, increasingly suggested from epidemiology that there is a link between maternal infection and a, a wide range of brain disorders and offspring. 
So there are increases in the incidence of autism, schizophrenia, and other brain disorders after historic outbreaks of flu, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, and polio, really after pandemics, right? And, and so there is a wide range of viruses, obviously, from that last list that I just mentioned, but there's an equally wide range of bacteria that can, that can also increase risk. And so because they're of the many pathogens, it's thought that the common denominator downstream of those pathogens, the maternal immune activation, is actually what's leading to changes in, in brain development and in behavior. Now, the million dollar question right now is whether COVID is activating similar pathways in uh, these moms and whether that's then going to increase risk of, of a number of these disorders over the, the coming years. And I think the jury is still out on that, but there are a lot of people looking at that, obviously. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, maternal in, uh, infection doesn't lead to just one disease, but it leads to a wide range of diseases. And, and risk um, for these diseases is contributed by both the genetic makeup of the mom and dad and of the offspring, as well as the timing and severity of the maternal infection. And that coupled together with various postnatal hits over a lifetime to lead to increased risk for different diseases at different parts of, of the lifespan. Such that if there's a, a, a very early, very severe brain uh, infection, it can lead to severe uh, maternal infection. It can lead to severe brain malformations like um, the microcephaly that, that you've heard about with Zika virus. But most maternal infections, when they do lead to disease, lead to um, less severe diseases that lead to changes in, in connectivity and then diseases like autism, schizophrenia, depression, and even uh, neurodegenerative disorders. So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how maternal infection or maternal immune activation changes brain development to cause different disorders um, in, in offspring. And so uh, we, we turned uh, to uh, address this question to a mouse model of maternal immune activation. And this was a mouse model um, that was uh, established by uh, Paul Patterson's lab at Caltech and that one of your own faculty members, Elaine Chow, who's sitting here up front, um, uh, was really uh, pioneered and, and made it a very uh, uh, reliable model and learned a lot about, uh, about how this particular model leads to changes in uh, behavior in adult offspring. And so, um, so inspired by their lab, uh, we, we started using this model. So let me tell you a little bit about it first and why we think it's an important model. And then I'll tell you about some of the experiments that we did. So there are lots of different ways that you can uh, activate the maternal immune system. And there, there are lots of different pathogens. What we did um, was to use the, the model from Paul's lab where we inject poly-IC, which is a viral mimic that activates TLR3 receptors into pregnant mice at mid gestation. So at E12.5 here, and the dams get sick. They show a lot of sickness behavior, then they get better. They have litters in our hands of, um, sorry, I keep losing my mouse, but of typical size. And the animals look perfectly fine until you, you start running them on behavioral assays or until you look into their brain. And a lot of researcher from research from many, many different labs has uh, led to the conclusion that there are many behavioral aberrations in the adult offspring um, from MIA uh, that fall into domains that are consistent with the domains that are altered in schizophrenia and in, aut and, in autism. So there's evidence for reduced social interactions, for increased repetitive behaviors, for deficits in communication, for impaired sensory motor gating or PPI, for impaired working memory and for enhanced sensitivity to dopamine receptor um, agonists. In addition to these behavioral changes, um, there are also a number of neuropathological changes that are similar to those found in the brains of individuals with autism and schizophrenia. Um, and not just the brain, but also in the periphery. So Elaine beautifully showed uh, that there are changes in peripheral immunity and changes in the gut microbiome in the offspring of, of, uh, of MIA um, animals. There are also changes in connections between brain areas and changes in specific disease-related circuits. There's decreased hippocampal PFC connectivity, dopaminergic and GABAergic deficits, decreased cortical dendritic spines, autism-like alterations in a subset of Purkinje cells and increased ventricular volume and decreased cortical thickness. 
among other changes. As this field has expanded, there's a lot of, of data on what's happening in the brains of offspring. Okay, so, so that has led to a, a working model um, in the field that maternal immune activation that, um, that is caused, that is the result of, of activating these TLR3 receptors leads to an immediate induction, very rapid induction of acute phase cytokines, including pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, um, that then uh, leads to activation of TH17 cells and increased IL-17, that's from Gloria Choi's work, and that that then leads to changes in um, brain development in, in offspring. And those changes in, in brain development lead to a heightened risk for autism. If the individual doesn't get autism to a heightened risk of, um, of schizophrenia and other psychiatric illnesses, especially when combined with second hits. So my lab has been interested in this because we really wanted to know how this acute insult during med gestation could lead to changes in brain development and that, that would lead to these, these behaviors that are so well characterized. And so we, because we had this interest in looking at how immune molecules on neurons and at synapses in the brain regulate the formation of connections, we um, proposed that perhaps it's these molecules that might be mediating this effect. And so um, what, we, what we thought was that maybe these peripheral cytokines during gestation are leading to long lasting changes in cytokines in the brains of offspring that then might alter the expression of other immune molecules on neurons in the brain, like MHC class one, that would more directly alter connectivity um, in these developing brains and eventually leading to these changes in behaviors. And so, um, so when we started thinking about this, um, I wasn't sure about how to develop the, the maternal immune activation model. And so I had a great conversation with um, Paul Patterson, late Paul Patterson and Elaine at an SFN meeting, and we agreed to collaborate. And, um, and I'm gonna show you one small piece of a, of a paper that Elaine and a graduate student from my lab shown here, Paula Gray, uh, uh, published back in 2013. So what we wanted to do to see whether MIA led to long lasting changes in cytokines was to collect brains from MIA offspring at five different postnatal ages, and then uh, look at a number, we looked at four different brain regions and blood, and we ran them on a 23plex Luminex chip. I didn't wanna just look at the pro-inflammatory cytokines that people typically look at, I wanted to see what the full picture really was over time during development throughout the lifespan. And, and so what you're looking at here is a heat map only of data from frontal cortex, um, and what, what we did was Elaine generated the, the, all of these animals, there were many, she dissected the brain regions, she, um, she then froze them, sent them up to Paula, and Paula ran them on Luminex chips actually in Judy Vanderwater's lab at, at UC Davis. And so the way that we've summarized the data here is in a heat map. The, um, the, the colored boxes indicate a change in the MIA brains relative to saline brains. And the reds indicate an increase, blues indicate a decrease, and the depth of color indicates the magnitude of change. And so the first thing to, to look at here is that um, out of the 23 cytokines that we, that we examined, many of them were altered at some point during the lifespan. And in fact, this acute maternal immune activation did lead to long lasting changes in cytokines in the brains of offspring, all the way from birth through the development of the cortex, early periods of plasticity, and then into young adulthood. So that was pretty profound to me. I thought we'd find maybe one cytokine and maybe only early on, but this is, this is leading to long lasting changes here. The second thing that I wanna point out here is that while there are many different um, cytokines that are altered, there's a really interesting pattern in frontal cortex. So at P0, a number of cytokines are elevated during the period when connections are forming, P7, P14, and then early plasticity, the cytokines are really down in general, and then they're up again in the young adult. So what that suggests is that this is consistent with a pro-inflammatory uh, environment that is generated in the mom during gestation that might be reflected at P0, and it's also consistent with literature that suggests that there's a pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype, elevated cytokines in the brains of adult offspring. But if you want to understand how this is affecting brain development, we really need to take into consideration that actually what's happening to cytokine signaling and immune signaling is a major decrease during the period of brain development here. So, so 
that's a, a summary of, of that paper. There are other brain regions in blood that are in there. And if you're interested, I suggest you go to the reference. But basically what this is telling us is that our first, our first uh, step in our model is correct, that maternal immune activation leads to long lasting changes in, in brain cytokines. Since cytokines in the periphery signal through immune molecules like MHC class one molecules, we then wanted to know whether it also alters MHC one in the brains of these offspring. And we had, we had previously published a paper showing that MHC negatively regulates connectivity in the developing brain. And so the hypothesis would be, if it does alter MHC, that that would then lead to changes in connectivity. So another graduate student in the lab, Micah Estes, uh, used a culture system where we cultured neurons from newborn offspring, MIA offspring and control offspring. Uh, and, and these are neurons that are cultured from the frontal cortex. And so what she did is she then immunostained them with antibodies to MHC, just to the surface MHC that's important for signaling. And what you can see here are sections of dendrites from representative neurons. This is a neuron from uh, a saline, from a pup from a saline injected mom. And this is a neuron from a pup from a, from a poly IC injected mom. And these little white dots are the surface MHC. And it's really obvious um, just qualitatively that there's a pretty dramatic increase in the, in the neurons from the MIA moms. And when you quantify that, you can see that there's a, a almost doubling of surface MHC. And Micah uh, uh, validated this using flow cytometry for a specific form of, of neuronal um, MHC called H2KB uh, from taking neurons from, from the newborn brain and using flow cytometry. Okay, so, so at birth, cytokines are up. The hypothesis would be that MHC would be up. We've shown that, that here. And so if MHC gets elevated on neurons, we had previously shown that that leads to a, a decrease in connectivity. And so next, Micah used the culture system to look at synapses. And so, so what we do here is we culture the neurons from newborn pups for eight days. We fix an amino stain with a pre and a postsynaptic marker, VAMP2 and PSU95, and we count where they're co-localized as synapses. And indeed, you can see again qualitatively that the, the MIA neurons really look like there's a lot less yellow, many fewer synapses. And when she quantified that, we saw a pretty dramatic decrease in synapse density. So, so that's correlative, right? We now wanted to, to see whether this, the change in MHC was required for this deficit in synapse density. And so to do that, we had to come up with a way of normalizing levels of MHC in the MIA neurons. And so we, we had in the lab um, developed a way to do that using by transfecting neurons with beta-2 microglobulin shRNA. Beta-2M is an obligate uh, subunit of MHC class one molecules that's required for MHC to be exported onto the surface of cells. And so in the absence of beta-2 or decreased levels, you end up with decreased surface MHC. And so, so when you quantify surface MHC density here, uh, you can see that the beta-2 um, shRNA leads to a decrease in surface MHC. This is that increase that we see in the MIA neurons in MHC, and we brought it right back down to normal levels. We were lucky with the beta-2 shRNA. So now we could ask the question, when we normalize MHC levels on these cells, does that then rescue the deficit in synapse density um, in the MIA neurons? And in fact, if you look here, we've quantified synapse density. Um, here is the decrease in, uh, in the MIA neurons, and that's rescued um, when, we, when we rescue surface MHC. So that suggested to us that MHC, at least at birth, is critical for mediating the effects of, of maternal immune activation and causing a deficit in the ability of newborn neurons to form synapses. And in this paper, we went on to show that a, a, a signaling factor that's required for MHC to negatively regulate synapse density, MEF2 transcription factors is also required for this decrease in synapse density in the, in the newborn MIA neurons. We still have experiments ongoing to determine whether this pathway is critical for changes in connectivity at later ages and whether it's essential for, um, for these behaviors. So stay tuned for that. So together, this data started to, to lead to um, a more refined working model, um, kind of. Refined with um, cytokines is, is not exactly uh, synergistic, but um, basically what, what this has suggested to us is that this maternal immune activation is leading to elevations or decreases in cytokines in the brains of offspring 
that, that each of those cytokines uh, typically signal through cytokine receptors that are very specific to the cytokine, but they converge on JAK-STAT signaling. JAK-STAT regulates the transcription of, of a lot of genes, including MHC, and we think that it's at least um, MHC is partially responsible um, for, for the changes in connectivity that are caused by these changes in cytokines. And one of the important things to keep in mind here is that we've, I've just shown you data for birth, but what we would expect at these later ages would be for the opposite to, to occur, right? That our prediction would be that you would start maybe with a deficit in connectivity, and then you would get overgrowth and then a deficit again, which is consistent with, with a number of, of models of, of autism and schizophrenia. So, so together, our data has really suggested to us that immune molecules on neurons and possibly glia uh, may mediate both genetic and environmental contributions to psychiatric disorders like, like schizophrenia and um, autism. Okay, so, so as I, we, were, we were refining this model, we were getting more data that suggested that we might be able to tease apart the molecular pathways, I started to wonder whether maybe we could use this as a, as a valid preclinical model. Maybe we could start testing treatments if we were able to identify what molecular pathways were going wrong in the brains of these offspring. But as, as we all know, translating discoveries from mice to, to humans can be uh, really difficult and it often fails. And so we were very interested in, in collaborating with um, investigators at UC Davis, David Amaral and Melissa Bauman that had established, again, and in, in inspired by Paul Patterson, uh, a non-human primate model of, of maternal immune activation. And the idea there was to start to, to figure out what was common between the mouse and the monkey model so that we could, we could study that specifically in the mouse as for preclinical validation. And so um, we, we started this collaboration. We started a big center. We were funded by um, uh, NIMH for this. And it involves our mouse model, Melissa's non-human primate model, um, and then comparison to uh, clinical populations, both for schizophrenia in an early intervention clinic run by Cam Carter, and um, also um, for autism at the Mind Institute. And we collaborate closely with immunologists and then um, also with uh, experts in transcriptomics and genomics. Um, your own Dan Geshwin has been a major part of this. And, um, and Katie, who is up front um, from Dan's lab is, is working with this uh, through this collaboration now too. So, um, so one of the things that, uh, that we were interested in understanding is whether maternal immune activation uh, alters a shared molecular pathway in the brains of offspring in mice and monkeys. And, and before I get to that question, I, should, I, I don't have time to tell you all about the monkey model. Um, I wanna put a shout out to uh, my colleague, Melissa Bauman, who if you haven't heard her speak, um, she's got a lot of data on how maternal immune activation alters uh, cortical development throughout um, the first few years of, of life in the, in the non-human primate. Um, and she's, she's got a lot of data that I don't have time to get into. Um, what she has done is she's validated that, that this maternal immune activation leads to a range of behavioral abnormalities in the offspring that are also consistent with some of the domains that are found in autism and schizophrenia. Um, and she uh, found that these animals at three and a half years, which is really early, early adolescence um, in the monkey, that they have uh, the hallmark of, of psychosis, which is elevated striatal dopamine. So, so that made us feel, feel more confident that, that these animal models are strong and are, are valid for studying um, pathways that might lead to, uh, to these diseases. So, um, so we have initiated a much broader screen with, in collaboration with the Geshwin Lab, looking at, at changes in gene expression in the monkey. We published that in collaboration with Mike Gandel um, and Nick Page a number of years ago, and uh, Katie's working on the mice and looking to see whether how, how gene expression changes in the brains of offspring. Um, but I got impatient before we started all of this. We had to have some preliminary data um, to get funding for it. And so I ran an RT-PCR I, my lab, ran an RT-PCR screen uh, looking at, at the expression of 21 different cytokine receptors now, um, gene expression of receptors in the mouse and monkey brains. We looked at the monkey brains at three and a half years and then the mice at four different postnatal ages. And we found um, really uh, incredible overlap 
um, for one time point in the mice, which was a little bit earlier than we had expected, P14 to the three and a half year old monkeys. And, and that's basically summarized here. So for most of the cytokine receptors that we looked at, there were no changes in gene expression in the MIA offspring relative to the controls. Um, but there, there were uh, a number where there was, there were changes. All of them were decreases, um, which is interesting, similar to the decreases in cytokines that we had seen. Um, and there was remarkable conservation between the mouse and the monkey. So we saw the largest changes, the largest decreases in the IL-1 receptor family. This is interleukin-1. It's a um, pro-inflammatory cytokine that also regulates synapse formation in the developing brain. Um, so we saw that both in the IL-1 uh, R1 receptor and in the accessory-like receptor in the mouse. We also uh, saw decreases in CCR5, which um, Alcino Silva has shown is, is uh, critical for learning and memory. Uh, we saw decreases in the GMCSF receptor in the mouse and in its homologue, the IL-3 receptor in the monkey. And then we saw some of these complement signaling molecules that we might have expected, uh, the fractal changes in fractal kind receptor and CR3. And so we're, we're really interested in following up on these specific receptors as targets for developing novel PET ligands to be able to identify the subset of patients with autism and schizophrenia that actually might have a neural immune component. We know it's not gonna be everyone, but we wanna be able to identify um, which people have this and if they do. And, and then we want to be able to develop treatments to, to target these specific pathways. And we feel more confident to do this now that we know which pathways are similar between the, the mouse and the monkey model. So, so we can think about treatments that way, but we can also, um, given the strength of these animal models, start to think about whether we can use the animal models to predict which pregnancies will lead to aberrant outcomes in offspring and which will be resilient. So one of the things that, that we know from the human literature is that most moms that, that get infections do not end up with offspring with autism or schizophrenia, right? So most infections lead to resilience, not susceptibility. And, and that's a factor that really hasn't been taken into consideration with these animal models at all. And so, so we, we went back and thought and started looking at the mouse model and started some studies that I'll tell you about now to see whether we could identify susceptibility and resilience in the pregnancies and then to start to identify in the susceptible pregnancies, what are the changes in gene expression during fetal development that we might be able to target to even prevent any changes by the time um, the, the animal or the person eventually is born. So, so as I mentioned, um, most pregnancies for ma after maternal infection are resilient. And, and keep in mind for the susceptible pregnancies, uh, some of these pregnancies lead to um, major depression, others to schizophrenia, and others to um, intellectual disability. What is it about the maternal infection that actually causes, even when you're susceptible, different, different outcomes, different disease outcomes in the offspring, right? So we don't know how to predict that yet, but we've been, we've been working on that in the lab. Um, and this is work that was done. It was, it was published in 2020 in BBI, and it's ongoing. It was it really uh, pioneered by Micah Estes, who was a grad student in the lab. Catherine Prendergast is continuing this. She's a grad student in the lab. And then a, a talented technician, Deb Vanderlist, and an undergrad at the time, Jeremy McMahon. And, and so in the, in the field, in the literature, it is explicitly um, proposed that there's going to be a linear correlation between the amount of maternal immune activation and the severity of outcomes in offspring. So it's thought that the more maternal immune activation you get, the worse it is in, in offspring. And so we thought this was going to be a really quick project. And we tried three different doses. We thought this is exactly what we would find. And when we looked at, at um, a number of different measures, it was consistent with that up to a point. And then we got some surprises. So, so when you look at maternal sickness behavior, which is what is, is plotted here, all three doses of poly-IC, 20, 30, and, and 40 milligrams per kg led to, led to sickness behavior decreases in activity. Um, but then we saw a dose-dependent change in uh, temperature in the animals that were injected, especially with this intermediate dose of, of poly-IC with the 30 milligram per kg dose. It wasn't that the moms were affected more dramatically in the, in the higher dose. 
Um, here we did see a dose dependent uh, change in, in weight in the animals, in the, in the moms, these are dams. Um, and we saw increases in interleukin-6, which is that pro-inflammatory cytokine that we think mediates this model um, in all of the doses, but it was substantially less in the 20 milligram dose um, than it was in the 30. And in the 40, it, it seemed to reach a threshold at 30 and didn't increase over, over 40. Okay, so there's a little bit of dose dependent differences. So then we wanted to, to look to see what these different doses did to outcomes in the offspring. And uh, the behavior that we chose to use was a, a repetitive behavior, which is um, repetitive self-grooming. Um, and what we did was to look at the offspring from animals injected with 20, 30, and 40 milligrams uh, of poly IC. We saw no changes in the offspring that were in, that from the moms that were injected with 20. We saw this increase um, that we expected in repetitive behaviors in this model um, from the 30 milligram dose. But look at the 40, this was really surprising. We didn't see any change at that higher dose. So I'll come back to that in, in a minute. But one of the things that we did notice um, when we did this again with a much larger cohort is that there is a tremendous amount of variability in this assay. And this wasn't just because we were new to behavior, that was true at the beginning, um, but this was, this was truly uh, uh, in this model. And so this was true even when we plotted, um, this is individuals and this is when we plotted it appropriately for MIA by litter. So we average the behavioral um, uh, results from individuals into, into an N, which is the litter. So, so our immunologist um, friend uh, was, was talking to us, our collaborator, Judy Vanderwater, and said to one of my students, you know, you should probably just go back in and make sure that these isogenic animals actually have the same immunoreactivity. You assume that it's the same, all of these animals are the same, but you should probably just test that to be sure. And that was when we got a huge surprise. So the way that we tested that is we bring um, virgin female mice in from Charles River. These are cage mates. We usually bring in 40 or 50. So there are a lot of them. And we give them, we, we let them settle. We bring them in at seven weeks. We let them settle for about a week. We give them a low dose of IL-6. And then we pull their blood two and a half hours later and look, look sorry, we give them a low dose of poly-IC and then wait two and a half hours later, pull their blood and, and measure IL-6. And lo and behold, this was the, the, the results that we got. Tremendous variability in baseline immunoreactivity of these isogenic animals that we all assumed would have exactly the same responses, right? So, so then the question was, does this variability contribute to the variability in outcomes? And so we, we basically uh, took the, the whole population, we divided them into quartiles, took the lowest and the highest, um, and then uh, quartile and then took the middle 50% and turned them into low, medium, and high baseline immunoreactive groups. So I'm gonna call them low, medium, and high BIR. And again, this is before pregnancy, right? So, so this is something that, um, that we can measure before the animals even mate. And then we embarked on um, something that I didn't wanna do, but that we needed to do that turned into a three-year experiment with many different variables, looking at the effects of the three different doses that I told you about in each of these different groups of baseline immunoreactive dams. We did a lot of different measures. I'm just gonna show you some of the behavior in one molecular figure on this. So, so we, we, we measured um, both grooming, as I mentioned a minute ago, and rearing behavior, so exploratory behavior from the same assay. And what you're looking at, since you're gonna see a number of these graphs, this is grooming, this is the rearing behavior. Um, these are all animals that are young adult animals, their offspring from uh, pregnant mice from, um, that had low, medium, and high BIR groups, BIR measures before pregnancy, that were injected with 20 milligrams per keg of poly-IC during pregnancy, okay? And just like from the pooled data that I showed you, there's no effect um, on grooming on offspring at the 20 milligram per keg dose. There is a pretty dramatic set of effects that are a bit complicated for both grooming and rearing at the 30 milligram dose. And at the 40 milligram dose, again, we're not pulling out that many effects. There's only one group um, that has effects here. So I'm gonna dive deeper into the data in the next two slides. Um, these are the same graphs, but now plotted just for um, the grooming and rearing at the 30 milligram dose. Okay, so these are all the animals that received the same dose, 
but you can see that their offspring have different sets of behaviors that are predicted by the baseline immunoreactivity of the mom. Okay, so, so for example, for the medium 30 group, there is an increase in grooming and there's decreased rearing relative to control in their offspring. But in the same animals uh, that receive the same dose, but that came from a high BIR group, the phenotype's different. There's no change in grooming and enhanced rearing in those offspring. So, so what this suggests to us is that um, we may be able to use our, our model to actually start to figure out how exposure to the same dose of poly IC can lead to different, just different sets of outcomes in offspring, right? Which is similar to what happens with this risk factor in, in humans. And so we're running, we just finished running a, a wide range, a big battery of behavior so that we can look across a number of different domains and we're analyzing that data now. Um, but we're, we're very interested in understanding how BIR, whether it does, and how BIR dictates different combinations of behaviors in offspring um, in susceptible pregnancies. So now what you're looking at is a comparison between the same BIR group of mice that are exposed to the 30 milligram per kg or the 40 milligram per kg, okay? Here and here, that's what's highlighted here. And what you can see is that um, the higher dose in the same group of animals that have a similar baseline immunoreactivity actually leads to no change in the offspring. So we think that, that these are, they're resilient in our hands so far. They're resilient for juvenile social approach. They're resilient to a number of behaviors that we've looked at. We still need to, to look across a wider battery to see whether they're truly resilient to everything. But, but what this is really strongly suggesting is that it's the intermediate levels of the baseline immune responsiveness and poly IC dose that are most detrimental to the offspring, um, especially in these repetitive grooming assays, but we've seen this in other assays as well. And, and we really wanna understand whether this uh, resilient group is truly resilient. And if it is, what is the protective factor in, in these pregnancies that is protecting against, um, against the deficits in the offspring? Because that's another target for being able to develop therapies. Right? So, um, so there's a lot of ongoing work that we're doing um, about that. Now, if you, if I'm just showing, yeah, sure. Is that okay, Carla? Uh, except that you don't have a microphone so that people on Zoom can't hear. I don't want to make a big deal of it. It's not the top of the I, this is phenomenal. If you just totally ignore the groups and just do, just calculate the data and the relationship between behavior and the um, inflammatory response, do you get a relationship? Um, so that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it because we typically only measure maternal IL-6 at, at two and a half hours after injection of poly-IC. There is obviously a wide range of cytokines that are changing, and that's one of the projects for our, our, the renewal of our Conti Center that we're working on because um, we want to know what the full changes are so that we can, we can figure that out. We, we, hope to see that. We expect to see that there will be a signature. We hope to be able to find that. Yep. Okay. So, so it's not just behavior though, right? Um, it's also molecular expression of, of, of genes. So um, of proteins. So we, um, we have forayed into this just a little bit by using Western blotting in the uh, striatum of newborn offspring. Since this is a, a grooming uh, behavior, we wanted to know whether in the newborn offspring, whether there were changes in a number of different molecules that we were um, interested in that would regulate connectivity. And so we looked at, at MEF2A, um, we looked at STAT3 and um, tyrosine hydroxylase and basically found that in that, that most affected group, the one group that had changes in repetitive grooming, that we did see um, changes in these molecules selectively um, in, that, in that one affected group. So, so we fully expect to see uh, changes in gene expression that we'll be doing um, with the Geshwin lab to look to see what might be mediating susceptibility and resilience to specific combinations of behaviors. Okay, so, um, so there's a lot to follow up on about this. Um, I'm really excited about this. this. This formed the premise for the renewal of our Conti Center. We're continuing our collaboration with Dan's lab um, and with Judy Vanderwater's lab, looking across mouse and monkey um, at baseline immunoresponsiveness. And really what we're hoping to do is to test whether measures of, of the baseline immuno 
immune responsiveness uh, before pregnancy can actually reveal biomarkers to predict um, which pregnancies are actually going to be at risk and uh, the specific immune pathways uh, that, that uh, we might be able to target during pregnancy to prevent um, any, any adverse sequelae in the, in the offspring. So, so now that we know which group is susceptible though, we can also start to go in and figure out what are the molecular pathways that lead to susceptibility. So, so we haven't done this in, in, in any of the resilient groups, but we have looked in the 30 medium uh, offspring to see what's happening during fetal development. And this is the last project that I'll tell you about. It's a collaboration with Alex Nord's lab um, and two very talented postdocs, uh, Cesar Canales and Carol Chikowitz. And um, what we did is we generated our, our animals. We then dissected dorsal telencephalon at uh, four prenatal ages now. So this is six hours after injection of poly-IC, two days later, uh, five days later, and then at birth. And um, Alex's lab performed bulk RNA-seq from the dissected uh, uh, telencephalon, then did differential expression analysis, WGCNA, and then we validated a number of the, um, of the candidates using uh, histology and, and uh, Western blotting. Okay, so, um, so this is a heat map of the differentially expressed genes that you can see here, um, showing the log fold enrichment um, relative to salines. And this is at the four different ages that we examined. So you can see that there definitely are differentially expressed genes. Uh, this is another way to plot it, right? With the um, volcano plots where you have uh, elevated um, genes and then, and then ones that are, are um, down-regulated relative to saline. And this really uh, illustrates the number of genes at each of the different times that are altered um, based on different confidence levels. And so if you look at, at the most stringent criteria, which are the darker bars here, it's very clear that the number of expressed genes uh, ramps up over time to peak at E17.5 and then um, decreases again by birth. So this E17.5 period seems to be really critical. We also uh, compared the differentially expressed genes to those that are found in uh, as high confidence genes from the Simons Foundation database. Um, and we found that there, there wasn't a lot of overlap at E12.5, there was more at E14, but if you look here at E17.5, that time when there are the most differentially expressed genes, we found quite a lot of overlap, suggesting that some of the, the autism-related pathways may be relevant for the maternal immune activation um, induction in, in the in gestation. So the WGCNA revealed um, a number of, of phases of transcription uh, that, that happen over time during fetal development. Um, and, and the first uh, really was, was highlighted here at E12.5. And um, it, it included genes that were immune genes, metabolic genes, and um, a lot of response to hypoxia genes. And these are genes that have come up in, um, in other animal models of autism. The second wave that happens later um, around E17.5 were in these blue and turquoise modules that actually showed down-regulated genes um, it, for cell proliferation um, here and um, up-regulated genes for, uh, for cell differentiation, for glutamate receptor function. And so um, this suggested to us that these two waves, these two time points might be important. So some of the genes in this first wave that we found um, that were really interesting um, were genes, again, that related to hypoxia, but there were a lot that were related to angiogenesis and this VEGF pathway in particular. And, and so if you look at, at um, the, the plots here, you can see that at both E12.5 and E14.5, there are these um, changes in VEGF A. And um, if you look at the a different way to plot it here, you can see that that's significant at the early ages is actually elevated at all of the ages um, in the MIA offspring for VEGFA and its receptor um, FLT1. This is interesting because VEGFA is not only involved in angiogenesis, but it's also involved in, um, in the conversion of neurogenesis to gliogenesis during early brain development. And this is a, a time point and even a molecule that's been implicated in other um, neurodevelop models of neurodevelopmental disorders. So we're very interested in going after this pathway to see if we can, if we can uh, use it to normalize the phenotypes. 
So at E17.5, I mentioned during that second wave of transcription, there's a major down regulation in cell proliferation genes. And so using immunohistochemistry, we validated that by using markers for progenitor cells, PAC6 and SOX9, proliferative cells, KI67 and PH3, and intermediate progenitors, TBR2. And so you can see here the, the red um, in the control brain, that's typical localization of progenitor cells uh, labeled by PAC6. And, um, and that is in the poly IC brains, that's pretty dramatically decreased. Um, it's also true for SOX9 that's found in the same place, also labels progenitor cells. Um, same for KI67, you can see that there's a lot less green in these two images, a lot less TBR2. And there's quantification for, for all of this. So this uh, validated that there are definitely decreases in, in progenitor cells. Um, interestingly, we did not see changes in overall cortical thickness though. And we didn't see any of the heterotopias or cortical dysplasias that have been reported in this model um, from, from the Choi lab. And so we looked at, at across multiple regions of the cortex, including um, S, S1DZ, uh, which is uh, in the somatosensory cortex that's been specifically implicated in, um, by other labs, but we did not see any change in cortical thickness but consistent with their reports, we did see changes in lamination. So, um, so the phenotype that we see in the uh, MIA offspring is one of a mature, more mature phenotype. So um, in the controls, these uh, different layer markers, TBR1 for, for layer six and CTIP2 for layer five and a subset of layer six, they're, um, they're overlapping here. So they're, they're separated a little bit and then overlapping as you can see in this little, this little highlighted area. Um, but they're completely overlap over. They're completely separate in the MIA brain, which is what you see in later development. And so um, there are a number of, of different uh, markers that we use to, to show that there are some some deficits in, in lamination here in the offspring. And then finally, we we also found uh, changes in non neuronal cells. So when we looked at using a marker of uh, radioglia and uh, a subset of astrocytes, GFAP. What we found was that in the control brains, we definitely see it as we should, but it's dramatically upregulated um, in, in, uh, in levels in the MIA brains. And you can see the change in gene expression that that, that, that validates here. And another marker of oligodendrocyte proliferation, OLIG2, um, is also upregulated uh, and it's upregulated uh, uh, significantly here at E17.5 and from the gene expression. So this validated the changes that we saw with gene expression, this particular molecule is also really interesting in terms of its role in regulating that transition from neurogenesis to gliogenesis. And so just to make that point, when you look at these neurogenesis genes, they're dramatically decreased in the MIA offspring. And when you look at, at GFAP and OLIG2, they're dramatically increased at this E17.5 time point. So um, we're excited about these results. We're, we're trying to understand a little bit about how this shift in maturation during uh, fetal development can lead to changes in connectivity. I think this is one of the, the big issues in the field that we, we don't have links between these, these kinds of changes that have been reported in our model and in multiple models. Um, and we're really interested in going after the, the VEGF pathway and understanding its causality, if there is any, in, in causing these phenotypes. So with that, I've told you that immune molecules within the brain um, typically regulate brain development and they mediate the effects of maternal infection in, uh, and on changes uh, in behavior in the brains of offspring. I've also shown you that uh, we can use the baseline immune responsiveness and the dose of poly IC to start to predict which pregnancies will be susceptible and resilient um, and to start to figure out what mediates that both in the mom and in the, in the pup. And in the susceptible pregnancies, I've shown you that there are a couple of waves of changes in, in neuropathology. There's an acute induction of genes associated with stress, immune signaling, and angiogenesis. And then uh, there's a later effect in shifting development where there's decreased proliferation and increased maturation in the offspring. I uh, indicated all of the people that did the work as I went through, but this is a, an amazing team that really stuck with it with that, with that three-year experiment. Um, our Conti Center is, is absolutely fantastic, and um, the Nord Lab in doing uh, in running all of that analysis for the last set of experiments that I told you about. And then finally, um, we're really grateful to NIMH for, for funding us. But um, as Carlos mentioned, 
uh, way back when, when we first started looking at immune molecules, we couldn't get any federal funding for this. And so a lot of private foundations, including the Simons Foundation, um, Autism Speaks, and, and um, a number of other foundations uh, funded our work. So thank you.